Thanks for tuning in to this episode of I Have Something to Say, where subject matter experts are unafraid and unapologetic about sharing their perspectives regarding issues that impact our lives. They speak up because basically they give a shit. So if you're tired of canned answers and want to finally hear real people cut through the BS and talk about real issues, this is the podcast for you. I'm your host, Sami Heyman Marrero from Urbander, and behind our mixer is our producer, Chris Majoka from You Do You. Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of I Have Something to Say. This is going to be really, really good. I'm so excited. I always love to have uh, an incredible creator. Every time we have someone that's a creator, but this is like epic and beyond. It's incredible on um, what my friend here, Mario Agastume has done in his career and the way he's reinvented himself um, from being a major or prime designer with brands like Tommy Hilfiger and Ralph Lauren to embarking on an entirely different route, you know, in the home remodeling and design and painting and all of that. So it's still design, right? Right, Mario? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Avenue and then finding a void within that industry, the and the home remodeling industry, and saying, wait a second, I need to make a better product and then patenting it. So anyway, I'm like my jaw drops every time <laughs> I see one of your posts on LinkedIn because I'm like, okay, what is he doing now? It's like, you know, <laughs> it's like you're amazing. And so welcome, welcome, Mario. I'm so excited to talk to you. How are you? Everything is good, but thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Yes, totally. Well, I want to let's let's take a couple of steps back, just a few years back, you know, at your beginnings of design and what propelled you to get into, you know, that space of shoe design. I'm like, you know, we 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 all know the look, you know, the local shoemaker, although those hardly exist anymore, right? Um, yeah. you know, uh, but but how to get into shoe design, such a like particular aspect, right, of the design and the apparel industry, and and how did you make it? Like, how did you? Uh, step into it, no pun intended, and then uh, and then grow within that industry to reach that level of performance, you know, for, for these big major international brands. Oh, perfect. Yeah, definitely. You know, so thank you again for having me, you know, and um, so pretty much, you know, I got into the shoe industry, you know, um, I was the first one to go to college in my entire family. And pretty much where it started for me was my art teacher in high school noticed that I had a talent for art. And I, I never knew it, you know, so make a long story short, you know, she saw that I had a talent for art. She helped me get into college and I did five years for um, Massachusetts College of Art and Design. So I got a bachelor's degree. And then while I was in college, um, New Balance came into our um, classroom. I was like a sophomore that year and New Balance had come in to give us a, a project to design a basketball shoe. And that for me was, I knew what, when I was hooked, you know, because I was a, a sophomore, but I was also in class for like juniors and seniors. Mm. But I was hooked, you know, because I would notice that all the other, you know, students would come in with like four or five drawings, but, the, and their drawings would also look like shoes that you could already buy in stores. You know, it's like they almost <laughs> traced them all. But for me, I knew I was hooked because I was doing like maybe 10 to 15 designs. Mm -hmm. And my stuff didn't look like anything that was in stores. My stuff looked complete the opposite. And it looked like futuristic stuff, like <laughs> way out in the future, alien stuff with like no shoelaces, you know. And so, I mean, from then I knew that I was hooked, you know, and I knew I wanted to do shoe design. And I got into shoe design because right, I wasn't even done with college yet, but I started working at the Stride Ride Corporation and designing shoes for Tommy Hilfiger. And the best thing was, they were paying me full time while while I was only working part time because I was going to school full time, mm. only to promise them that when I finished college that I would go work for Tommy Hilfiger full time. And that was my first step into the shoe game right there with Tommy Hilfiger. Wow, that's yeah. crazy! Like, like that doesn't happen every day, right? Like we know we know this, right? That you're in this space, they give you 
an opportunity because the talent is just there and it's fully evident. And then you're doing your your part. You're basically with one foot in academia and one foot in in like adulting <laughs> because you were still a kid, right? Yeah. And then, and then automatically you just land in like this dream job working for like one of the biggest brands in the world, um, designing shoes. How was that? How, how, how was that experience? Talk to me, man. That was amazing. But I want to back up a little bit because when you first started off saying that, and you said that that doesn't happen for the first time ever, I actually got chills on my body. I don't know why when you said that, because you know, that's really the truth, you know, because yeah, it doesn't like, happen. <laughs> yeah. Especially like where I come from as a kid, you know, not to back up because I'm not sure what questions you're going to ask me later, but you know, even like where I come from, you know, like my hometown and, um, you know, you know, I was, you know, like I said, the first one to go to college in my family, but really just the way that I grew up and the way my, you know, my life kind of went in that direction was just really like a, just like a dream come true. I would have never imagined that would ever happen, you know, and, um, and, you know, and the best thing was, you know, I was designing shoes for Tommy Hilfiger when he was like the hottest brand on the market. I'm talking about 1997, 1998. Mm -hmm. So Tommy yeah. Hill was on the top, you know, and, you know, and I got to take, I remember, you know, I used to go to New York City and I used to sit in these meetings, you know, because they don't happen so fast for me. You know, it happened mm -hmm. so fast. And I would sit in these meetings of like 30 people and, you know, all these executives, you know, and they don't know poor little Mario, the designer over here is like, you know, really chasing something, just chasing a dream. And, and I would just be looking at all these people in this meeting with me and, to everybody else, it probably felt like just a meeting to them. But to me, I was looking at Tommy Hilfiger saying, man, I want to be like that guy, you right. know? And uh, so that's why, like, I, you know, like, just meeting Tommy Hilfiger and, you know, I remember being 22 years old and, you know, them telling me that I have to go to China. And mm -hmm. I couldn't believe it. You know, I called my mom, mom, you know, that, you know, I'm going to China. And they're like, who, what are you talking about? Who's paying for that? And I said, Tommy Hilfiger, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and um, so it was just amazing, you know, um, I, I, got, I got to go to New York all the time, staying in the best hotels and designing the best shoes for Tommy Hilfiger. I got to meet him maybe like four or five, four or five times. And um, it was just the most, like, best experience of my life, you know, those yeah. years. I could imagine. I could, I can imagine. I can totally imagine because, because again, that doesn't happen every day. And so... Then, then you you I know that you've designed for other shoe manufacturers too, right? And yeah. and kind of reached the the like best selling kind of shoe like that. You really reached like the top in terms of from a design standpoint, in terms of recognition, right? For for creating something that had never been designed before and that was a top seller. In the yeah. retail um, category, talk to me yeah. about that. Yeah, so so then so then before I left Tommy Hilfiger, the best thing about Tommy Hilfiger, I'll back up just one second, was um when I was there, he was so tired of seeing all the old designs, you know, like you know the designers they already had, so you know they were like, so with Tommy Hilfiger, they created a new um a line called Advanced Concepts, and it put me on that you know so that mean that meant like designing stuff that didn't exist yet like kind of like mm -hmm. when i was in college you know i've drawn all those crazy yeah. stuff so i did advanced concepts so tommy hilfiger i remember having a meeting with them actually and then i designed back then a tommy hilfiger in 1997 the first basketball shoe without shoelaces <laughs> and i just wanted to bring that up because now in two, 2021 they're trying to do that you know these big major shoe companies but i was already doing that 20 years ago you know and it was on my review yeah. So I was doing a lot of advanced concepts. And then one day at my Tommy Hilfiger job, my phone rings and it was a recruiter from Ralph Lauren. Mm. And, you know, they called me and, hey, Mario, you know, we've been searching you for a couple of weeks, you know, this and that. And we would like to give you an opportunity to come meet us over here, at Ralph. And they pretty much gave me the golden ticket. You know, they doubled my salary. <laughs> they, gave <me> a sign -on. <laughs> they gave me a sign on bonus, you know. And um, so then I ended up moving, making my move over to, to Ralph Lauren. Mm -hmm. And then at Ralph Lauren, it was the same thing. You know, I got major responsibilities. You know, at the time I was the only, you know, and when I went for the interview with the guy from Human Resources, I mean, we spent the day together. I mean, I, I, mean, I felt like he was drafting me for the NBA. You know, we, went, <laughs> we took me to the new campus at Reebok because Reebok had the new license, you know, for Ralph Lauren. And yeah. he took me to his house and we're like playing basketball in his driveway. He's, you know, just getting to know each other. 
And so it was that type of a job. They really wanted to take care of me. And, you know, I remember him sitting me down saying, Mario, you know, we need some designers like you, this and that. So I started over there at Ralph Lauren. And then it was the same thing. I had huge success, like really fast over at Ralph Lauren. And, um, and I remember, you know, when I started working there too, I, I was in a meeting like I was a Tommy Hilfiger, you know, like one of my first meetings that I had, there was again with like maybe 30 people. And it was a, a, an executive meeting and there was like all kinds of people there, presidents, directors, everybody. And mm -hmm. then it was just me. And then they hired a brand new designer from Nike and a brand new designer from Adidas, top designers. Mm -hmm. And I remember the president that day saying, listen, we have one more chance to get this right for Ralph Lauren. Because Ralph Lauren was like Tommy. He was already tired of seeing all the same old designs that you could already yeah. see in stores. He, want, he wanted something new. So she said, you know, um, you know, we have one more chance to do this. And if we don't get this right, nobody has a job, you know. So to make a long story short, um, a shoe that I designed called the Trail Runner 2000 became the most famous shoe by Ralph Lauren. I mean, he loved it. You know, when we sent it to China, they, they didn't even know how to make it. They had to actually had to send me over there so that I could sit down with the engineers and all that stuff and, you know, show them and kind of walk through with it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, so th that was like, you know, very incredible tour Ralph Lauren. I had huge success. And one, one of my other shoes called the Trail I mean, the mask, the, the, the mask sold over a million pairs in one year, you know, which is wow. like unheard of for a company like Ralph Lauren. Right. And, and so, you know, and then so pretty much, for, you know, with that was, um, you know, that shoe was so hot that they called me in for the um, for Christmas. And, you know, the president at the time, Leslie Smith, she said it was almost like a top secret. She was like whispering, you know, and she said, listen, nobody is going to get a Christmas bonus this year. Nobody. She goes, you're the only one that's going to get oh. a bonus. Yeah, because, you're, you know, your designs are selling, you know, like crazy. And you're, you're pretty much holding the division together. And that felt so good to me because I would never imagine in my life that, you know, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. So anyways, right there, she handed me a check for $10,000 for Christmas. Holy cow. Yeah. It's you, like, you know, and like coming where I come from, you know, like ten, looking down and seeing $10,000. Yes. I couldn't believe it, you know. <laughs> so same thing you know, Rand, and I had huge success, you know, and um, it was just amazing. A lot of responsibility. They sent me all over the world to Indonesia, Japan, Hong Kong. I resigned three times and three times that, you know, don't, don't quit. You know, we'll send you to Miami with your friends, you know, don't mm -hmm. quit. We'll send you to Hollywood, you know? So, so anyways, at Ralph Lauren, I had a great time designing some of the best shoes at Ralph Lauren too. And it was, that's and, fantastic. And I feel like all of these, like these great experiences allowed you to see up close and personal the entire process, right? Even from a business standpoint, I mean, you say that you were in these meetings and I could imagine it was probably like surreal. Like, what the hell? Am I, I think it, that happened to me too. When I used to yeah. be publishing, I'd be in these meetings and I'm like, <laughs> like, what the hell am I doing here? Right? Like, I right? belong here, right? And because yeah. it, it, it's weird, right? Yeah. But yes. I can only imagine everything that you learn, you know, from a business standpoint, from forecasting, from sales, from pricing, from the quality from the manufacturing. I mean, they sent you to China for God's sake, right? Multiple times, you know? So, you know, from, from ideation, quite frankly, cause you're, that's you, right? Ideation concept, you know, to fulfillment, like the entire process, you've been exposed to it. And so, so when was that moment that you said, I can do this. I can have my own brand. Sagasuno. I'm gonna do I'm gonna do this like I'm I feel empowered. I feel like I have a shot at having my own line of shoes. And why? Why did you decide to, you know, like I say, it's like close your eyes, hold on to your business partner and to all those people that believe in you and just jump off that cliff, right? Because it's scary, but there had to be like a something that anchored that decision. So why, how and, and when and why did you, did you decide now it's not, now it's my, my turn? Well, I, I guess to be honest with you, because the, sh the shoe industry now compared to how it was 20 years ago, it's just not the same, you know, everything looks the same. You know, mm -hmm. I always say there's no innovation and all that stuff. And, you know, everything really just looks the same in the entire industry across all brands. Yeah. You know, so um, 
that's why like now, you know, I've been trying to do my shoe line for like a long time, but I guess the moment came now, you know, and, um, you know, where I, w- I wanted to do it now because I feel like it's the perfect moment, you know, mm-hmm. and I didn't want to just design, a, a, you know, just a regular collection. You know, I really wanted to design something that meant something, you know, so that's why mm-hmm. like I designed my own shoe line. Um, I made the first, I made the first um, prototypes in China. Mm-hmm. You know, it was missing something. They did a nice job, but it was still missing something. Then I made the second prototype and all factories got all the same drawing. I, I did one yeah. drawing and I sent mm-hmm. them because I wanted the best shoe. Then yeah. I sent it to, um, and then I had it made it here in the USA, the prototypes still missing something. I didn't like it. And then I made the final ones in, in Italy and Italy, the Italians did an amazing job, yeah. an amazing yeah. job. So I call the shoe because of that. I not call the shoe the chosen one, and um, because it's just a beautiful shoe. And and the thing also too is like, um, the, the type of shoe that I have is like doesn't exist yet, you know, because I call my shoe a dress sneaker. And what I mean by that—that's what you know, I like... was gonna tell you. Yes, <laughs> I, I, I when I see the shoe, I want to get a pair. When I see the shoe, I'm like, okay, so it's kind of like a high top, right? Yeah, sneaker. Yeah. But it's so fancy. So then, what is it, right? So, so talk to me, because it's like, yeah. Listen, because the other thing too is like, because these kids nowadays they don't really dress up. They wear jogging pants, you know. But when I was a yeah. kid, you know, we used to always dress up, you know, in the eighties and you know nineties. It just felt good, you know. Yeah. So that's why, like, I kind of wanted to bring that feeling back, and that's why, like, I did, you know, like dressy, you know, and and still sporty at the same time, you know, because yeah. whether you're wearing a pair of shorts. Or if you're wearing a suit, you know, you can wear these sneakers really with any outfit. And I just yeah, really wanted yeah. you to feel your best, you know, when you wear these shoes. And I also did like a very beautiful packaging. You know, I did a nice red velvet box mm-hmm. with some gold lettering on it. You know, so yeah. I mean, not, not even your high end Italian designers are doing a collection like what I have, you know. So, yeah. you know, so I just really wanted something different and that doesn't exist in the market at all. You know, and that's that's where I'm at now. That's fantastic. So when did you start diving into creating your own line and um and how's that process been for you? Honestly, it's been I, I would say 20 years, but it's it's been a you know, it's been a hustle to be honest with you for 20 long years, you know. And yeah. and finally, you know, you know, I, I've tried many times in the past, but I failed so many times. I failed mm-hmm. probably more than anybody that I know. But mm-hmm. I just never gave up. And then I just kept on pushing forward. And now in 2021, I think that I have the most nicest shoe collection. And then yeah. I hope we we'll kind of get into it because even even besides that, you know, the way that I look at it, too, is like, say, for example, and th- this uh, this is why I'm so glad that we're doing this, because more than more than the shoes, another passion that I have is like, say, for example, we're Latin, right? Yeah. And there's 60 million Latin Latins in the United States alone, 60 million. Yeah. But there's never been, there's not even existing. There's never been a designer. I want to be a designer for everybody, but there's never been a Latin designer, mm-hmm. you know? So that's what, besides my shoes, I've always been chasing that to be like the Latin, you know, Tommy Hilfiger, Ralph Lauren, you mm-hmm. know? So the fact that, you know, you and I are talking about this, you know, like it just really, really means a lot. And I think you and I are ahead of the curve because, and I don't want to get off subject, but, for us Latin people, there's so many of us, but we don't really have leaders. Like, we don't have anybody we can call. We don't have anybody we can look up to. Like, we just don't. If you think about that for one second, we don't have any leaders, you know? Mm-hmm. So so I think, like, even, like, you and I doing this and Chris, you know, it just means so much because we're thinking ahead, you mm-hmm. know? And I don't want to I don't want to think ahead, but in about 10 years from now, we're going to be the biggest. We're going to be half the United States. Yeah. You know? So I think we're doing a good thing starting now, you know, because by the time that comes, you know, it'll be golden. But at least I think we're heading in the right direction. So I'm sorry if I get off the track. No, 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 no. I love it. I love it. And and I agree with you, you know, definitely that there there's something to be said about representation and about finding these mentors and these people, you know, that we can rely on, that we can that can be our sounding boards. Right. And so. Um, you know, from a Latin entrepreneur to a Latin entrepreneur, I totally feel you. And I know exactly what you're talking about, because this isn't easy. 
And, um, you know, there are a lot of peaks and valleys and sometimes a lot of like, um, how do you say, lateral moves that we need to make, you know, just to for sustenance, right, to be able to survive and, and, and focus our resources into our, our passion or like the bigger vision, you know. Uh, you know, your shoe line, right? And and they're beautiful. I'm I'm gonna make sure that we we have some kind of imagery that we can, you know, um share with with our audience. Um, but but you did exactly that, right? You you started a whole other, you know, company that is unrelated to um the shoe industry and the fashion industry, um, but in alignment with your creative, right, juices and with your business acumen, the business that acumen that you uh, garnered throughout those years in the corporate sector. And so when did you start to paint a, what, a residential um, painting, correct? Yes. Yep. Yeah. So, so, you know, I guess, you know, I, I got, I, I, you know, it's a crazy story, you know? Yeah, so how did, um, you, how did that happen? Right. <laughs> so, so a night, so after, after I left Ralph Lauren to make a long story short, after I left Ralph Lauren, I went to a smaller company, uh, which is probably a bad move on my part, you know, that promised me the world to only get fired 10 months later, you know, mm -hmm. and that to me was like my breaking point. I was going through some other personal stuff back at home in Boston. Mm -hmm. So I end up, end up meeting my wife. We end up, moving down to Florida, down to Miami, and I left everything behind to kind of like pretty much start over. Yeah. But when I got down to Florida, I mean, I hit rock bottom, you know, because I got down here, I didn't plan it. We kind of just left. There were no shoe companies, you know, 1999, no, 2000, 2001, the internet was just starting to take off, you know, so I get down here. I have a bachelor's degree in industrial design, you know, um, that didn't matter. I couldn't get me a job anywhere. Listen, I mean, I can I tell you why? I'm going to tell you why, Mario, because the same thing happened to me when I came from New York to, to Florida. It's a Florida thing. And it's, oh, a, it's like, it's who you know. This is not like in the Northeast man. where you can show up and be fresco and be fresh and assertive and, and show your you know, your papers, you know, in yeah. terms of your resume and diplomas or accolades or whatever the hell, right? Your portfolio, whatever. Yeah. And, and just like, you know, be forward and aggressive, right? And, yeah. and land the job because that happened to me when I went to New York, I got from Puerto Rico, I got a job in three weeks by being, by just being assertive and, you yeah. know, yeah. And showing up, right? In full force. But over here, when we moved to Orlando, oh my God. It was Man. horrible because it's who you know. It's really yeah. bad. Yes, I, I I know exactly what you're talking. Oh. About. Man, the horrible. worst. That yeah. was the worst time. That was probably the worst time you know ever. You know, yeah, the worst time. Yeah, the worst and time. So you then, know. So then you you're faced with that happened to me because I was working um for New York for the New York Post from Orlando, yeah. and I lost my job in 2008 because of the recession. And I'm yeah. like, okay. No one's calling back. I'm sending out resumes. No one's hiring man. or start my own business. Oh, man. And that's what I did. So is that the same thing that happened to you? That's exactly what happened. And let me tell you, back in those days, too, okay. I, I was trying to find, man, it was the most depressing time ever. Oh, I, went, I know. You, you know how it is, you know? Oh. I mean, I, w I went from traveling all over the world, making all kinds of money to coming down here and having two or three years and not even a dollar in my pocket. And that's a true story, man. I mean, yeah. I had somebody grabbed me, threw me against the cement and kept their foot on me for like seven yep. years or something like that. That's how long it took, you know? Yep. Yep. Totally. I get it. I totally get it. I know. I know. We almost lost our house. Man. One, one time we had like, what, 40 bucks in the bank account and a, oh, man. And a, and a, a relative died. And I'm like, dude, you need to go. I told my husband. Oh. Like, how the hell am I get there? And the sister gave her her frequent fly, flyer miles so he can go. And I gave him twenty bucks out of the forty that were left. Oh, man. Like, so I know I'm like, we okay, went. Like, yeah, same thing. I need twenty to buy milk for the baby. You know. Oh, man. Bad. So I totally get it. I feel you. I I oh. knew I knew this conversation was gonna be. <laughs> like meaningful because i it's that angst right oh man like, oh yeah. forget yeah. it yeah and so the then worst. how were those first how was it to get like the license for your your painting company and starting 
to network and, 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 and building from scratch, because I'm sure it was like from nothing to, to what yeah. you have now, which is a good network and yeah. like a good system, right. Of, of referrals and all of that. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, back then, you know, like when I first started, it was in 2002 when I hit rock bottom. I mean, it was so bad and, and trust me, it wasn't like I just moved down here and tried to find, besides trying to find a job, I called everybody that I knew everybody <laughs> in the shoe industry, I actually found some papers the other day in my closet and I found like yeah. maybe six sheets of paper and they were filled up on this side and also on the reverse side of everybody that I, and I had like maybe 400 names, you know, like yeah. I, I couldn't get, I couldn't get a break anywhere, nowhere. I mean, it was so depressing, you know, like so bad. Anyways, um, so, so the, the way I got into the painting and design was the neighborhood that we moved into. Um, my mother-in-law had bought a house. She's a widow. So we ended up moving down here with her in 2002, where your brother lives. That area was booming. They had a, you know, they started a brand new construction. Mm -hmm. A lot of houses are going up and I couldn't get me a job anywhere. But, and then in that, in that neighborhood, Riviera Isles, they had like maybe 25 model homes, like staged. And these homes look beautiful. You walked in, it looked like people lived there, but you know, they were very fancy with like custom home movie theaters and you know, you know, beautiful homes, you know, staged everything, you know, and my wife and I, you know, we used to go into these houses a lot, you know, a lot because we had, I couldn't find me a job, you know, so we used to like lay in the beds to make it <laughs> like our house, you know, we used to be like, man, can you imagine having a house like this? You yeah. know, some of them were like small, like a mansion, you know, I mean, they were huge. I wasn't used to seeing stuff like that back in Boston. So anyways, after like going to these houses for like, the hundredth time, you know, I was looking around. I told my wife, I said, you know, I can probably do this kind of work, you know, with like the crown molding and all that stuff. Cause I studied furniture design in college. And so to make a long story short, my mother-in-law's house became my practice house. <laughs> so I had nothing else to do. And my mother-in-law, she loves that type of stuff. You know, she yeah. loves that type of stuff. So we were at Home Depot like three to four times a day. I mean, everybody already <laughs> knew her and me by first name. And, you know, we would just go, you know, get crown molding. Um, you know, wallpaper, I was doing full finish, you know, like, and, you know, designs on these walls and I was doing landscaping, you know, and I mean, I really, so her house became my practice house. And, and so then that's what, that's where I started. My business was pretty much there. Cause then, you know, then the owner would come over and see the landscaping. Oh, wow. What a beautiful, you know, I do lights. I never did that stuff ever in my life. Right. It would come over like, wow, look at the landscape. And then all of a sudden, with the personality that my mother-in-law has, she would invite people inside the house. So then people would come in, wow, wow. And then who did this and who did that? Because there was nobody really at that time doing that kind of work in the neighborhood, Riviera Isles. There was really, yeah. I was really kind of like the only one. And, you know, so I did it, you know, I started at her house. Then I would do the neighbor's house. Then I would do the other neighbor's house. And then it kind of just grew from there. Yeah. And, and now fast forward. And then to make a long story short, um, I think she bought a house or something for like 275 or something like that, you know? And then 2008, right before it crashed, the guy, she sold it for like double the price, like whatever this oh and that. But the guy, God. the guy who came into the house, he came in, he was so in love with that house that he said, you know what? I want everything as is the curtains, the frames, everything, just take it close and go. So he really <laughs> loved everything, you know, like I really fixed it up. So that was kind of like my masterpiece, that house right there in Riviera Isles. Yeah. Um, and then I just kind of, you know, just started working in the neighborhood and just then eventually I'd work in another neighborhood. And then eventually, you know, I ended up getting like my license and insurance. And then, um, you know, fast forward, you know, I thank God, man, that I've done now like custom home movie theaters, you know, where I sketched them out. We've gone in now, we build them in people's homes. Yeah. Um, you know, I've done like now restaurants, you know, um, you know, dance clubs, you know, um, all kinds of stuff, you know. And like most just, of the word of mouth. This has all been because of the quality of your work and the originality, right? Of the, yeah. The, yeah, all. you know, the most amazing thing about that is like now, I mean, I thank God so much because now it's 2021 and sometimes I can't get to a house for like three or four months, but the people will wait. Like the, the, the wow. client will wait because they know we're going to do a nice job, you know. I, yeah. I got a crew too where like my wife says I have OCD and I kind of, Gave it to my guys, you know. So I have people that, yeah, I have, I have people that I have people that wait for us like three to four months, you know. And yeah. you know, I've even had somebody fly to Chicago for one day just to go paint over there and give me like a lot of money just to go for one day, you know. So wow, that's um, awesome. So it, it, you know, you know, but you know, I, 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 I'm happy now 
the way things turned out. But let me tell you, back when I was going through it at the beginning, you know, yeah. like what you and I were just talking about, it was rough, you know, and I would never imagine that it would, it's still rough sometimes, you know, but back then when I would be up on the side of somebody's house, you know, with outside is like 150 degrees out so hot, you can't even breathe. And yeah. I'm then I'd be crying, you know, on the side mm -hmm. of somebody's house, just thinking to myself, because I was thinking about my shoe stuff and designing all yeah, over the world. Course. And, and, you know, and I was in such a hole. I thought I was in a hole, but I wasn't, you know, and I thank God for everything, the way that it's turned out. But just mm -hmm. at the beginning was so hard, you know, like, just like I said, I'd be up on a ladder crying, you know, like in that mm -hmm. heat, like, how'd you get yourself into this situation, Mario? How? You know, mm -hmm. like, just hard work, pressure cleaning 5,000 to, to 5, square foot houses by myself, painting it by myself, just mm -hmm. really, really hard. At the beginning, I did everything, like, on my own. And yeah. Now, fast forward to, 21, to 2021, like what you said, man, I built, you know, a pretty nice company now, and, you know, I got a great reputation around here. I've met a lot of great people, and, you know, so it's been a lot of fun, and I'm glad the way everything turned out. Yeah, and and you're creating, you're creating. Now you're following your passion. So yeah. not only the shoe line, right? Which, by the way, where where can we? Is it on? Is it all online? Is it online retail, or how how can um we access? Yes, yes. So the work. So I, I got a couple of websites, you know. So the Saga Designs with the Z at the end. I'll send you all that information. That's for my yeah. shoe website. I also have another website called Saga Design Company. That's why I have my brush. Actually, I wanted to let you know about my yeah, brush. Yeah, no, I want to um, my that, paintbrush. Yes, uh -huh. um, uh -huh. And then I have Saga Painting and Design. You know, that's for my painting and design company, you know. So I, I got a few websites out there, but the yeah, shoe yeah, one is still serial, there. You're a serial entrepreneur. So, okay, so then you're painting, you're doing all of this remodeling stuff, and you're growing, and all of a sudden you realize these brushes, these brushes suck, basically, right? Like you're using stuff and... Yeah, you're like it does it. It's not. It's not doing the job as with your OCD. You realize, right? <laughs> you're like yep, this yep. is not fulfilling my needs, my yep. my detail oriented work, right? And so, yep. what was failing? What what was the void? What was the problem that you so, then so, needed to find the solution for? So the problem was, you know, where it hit me was at Home Depot, right here in Miramar. I was at Home Depot one day. And I was just looking at all the paintbrushes and I said, man, you know what? All the paintbrushes look the same. And there's about, there's about 50 paintbrushes. You know, when you're looking at the paintbrushes yeah. at the aisle, there's like 50 paintbrushes. And imagine me that I've been in the painting industry for a long time. Even for me, sometimes I catch myself looking around for like 15 minutes trying to find the right brush. Right. So I can't imagine the homeowner might be there for half an hour because there's so many brushes. Yeah. You know? yeah. And that's where they hit me. So I wanted to make like the all-in-one paintbrush. And then it really hit me because that same day, you know, I was thinking, I'm like, man, I need to make a paintbrush. You know, like, I, you know, I left Home Depot thinking that, like, man, I need to make a paintbrush. And then later on that same day is when it hit me. You know, I was up on a ladder and one of my guys, Marcos, I, I always say that a real painter keeps a scrape in his back pocket. Because I was up on a ladder, the extension ladder, and I didn't want to come all the way down to go to my van to go get a scraper. So I, I yelled out for Marcos, Marcos, did me scraper? Because he always had a scraper in his back pocket. When he threw it to me and I kept, caught it, that's when the idea hit me. I said, I need to design a paintbrush because I'm using it with a scraper on the end of it. Yeah. You know, so that, that was my idea with it, you know. So I went home and for like maybe, I would say like three or four months, I just started like working on this idea that I had of a paintbrush. And I started making the samples myself. And at the same time, I filed for patents, you know, because I kind of been through this in the past. So I've gotten ripped off, you know. Yeah. So, um, so I, every single day I would come home to like three o'clock in the morning because I knew I had a good idea and nobody had it, you know, nobody. Mm -hmm. And then but the most depressing part about it was that I wanted once I got my patent, then once I finished the master samples, I made them all myself and they look perfect. They look like a factory made them for me, but I actually made them myself. And mm -hmm. um so, but my biggest thing was I, I wanted to make my brushes here in the USA. Like more mm -hmm. than anything else, I wanted like a really nice quality brush made in the USA. So mm -hmm. I called everybody from California to New Hampshire. All the mm -hmm. manufacturers in the, in the USA, everybody turned me down, everybody. You know, mm -hmm. I couldn't get it made anywhere, you know, and, you know, so I, I went to Texas. I went to Las Vegas, um, couldn't get it made anywhere. So then once I couldn't get it make, made, then I reached out to like these big painting companies like Sharon Williams. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of business with Sharon Williams. And even me as a designer, 
and an entrepreneur and uh, as a painter and me being out there and meeting with so many people, I know what painters want, you know? So yeah. Sir Williams turned me down. So the fact that, that these big companies couldn't see that I had a good idea, I, I couldn't wrap my head around it. So right. everybody, once I couldn't make it here, then I tried to li license out my product. So Sir Williams turned me down. Corona brushes turned me down. They're out of Tampa, Florida, three hours from my house. They turned me <laughs> down. They make their brushes here. Um, Worcester, the best one is Worcester. They're in Home <laughs> Depot. And Worcester sells all this stuff to Home Depot all over the world. They told me no five times. And the last time I spoke to the CEO himself, and they passed on my brush. And my brush, I can tell you, is better than anything that they have in their arsenal. Because even the people at Home Depot, I would show them the employees and like, oh, my gosh, this is like the best idea. So even them, they turned it down. You know, Worcester, five times. I couldn't believe it. Everybody turned me down. So then once I got turned on by everybody, really my last choice was to make it overseas. But I was kind of like compromised over here because I already showed too many people. So I had to just keep on moving forward. Yeah. And I found me a good manufacturer overseas. And once I felt comfortable with, I found like 10 different factories. And when I found I felt comfortable with the right factory, then I released everything to them. And they made my brushes for me, you know. So now I have my own brushes with, you know, the four first letters of my last name called Saga. Yeah. And, and um. And, you know, so it's called Saga. And so it's got the invention on it, you know, and, you know, it's got, you know, so I made my own brushes. I, I didn't stop, you know, so now yeah. I got my own production. Um, I would really love to make my brushes still here in the USA, but I know that I have the most innovative paint brushes, you mm -hmm. know. And if you want, actually, I can, once we're finished, I can actually bring the brush here. I have it right here. And then yeah, yeah. the shoes, if you wanted to see them real quick. So anyways, I just never gave up. And I know that I have the most amazing paintbrush. The employees from Home Depot tell me, the employees from Sherman Williams tell me, but all these major shoe companies, I mean, all these major paint companies all turned me down, you know? So, yeah. um, and, and I know I'm more advanced, you know, like 20 years ago, I designed that advanced shoe in the basketball for the yeah. shoe industry. And now it's like, I kind of feel like I'm at the same place with the paintbrush. Right. And, uh, so I, I got that. I have the paintbrush. I have a, a, another patent for a paint bucket that I designed, you know? So I have a few patents now for the painting industry. Fantastic. And so you're just shopping it around at this point. You're trying to find where like a retailer to get it into and and or how are you moving the product? Well, I'm moving it pretty much now, like on Instagram, on TikTok, okay. you know, because, okay, um, cool. you know, for some reason, something kind of just pretty cool happened on TikTok. You know, I put a um, a video up there a couple months ago and I was brand new to TikTok. Yeah. And it's going viral now, like all over the world. You know, it's got yeah. like two, 200 million views and, you know, it's got like over 2 million likes on YouTube, you know. So I got like a quick um, following like on, you know, Instagram and TikTok. So I've been kind of yeah. promoting it through, through, through social media. Yeah, through that's, that's really great. Yeah, because that's what's happened with social media, right? That it kind of brings, um, how do you say, equal access, right, to to people because you just put it out there. And if it's great, it's going to stand on its own. Right. So yeah. I'm really happy to hear that. Yeah. And uh, and it, it'll happen. It'll it'll happen for you because I think um, that uh, it's innovative and people are looking for good, innovative and helpful, convenient too, right, for solutions. Yeah. I think that people are looking for things that can fix a problem. You know, and I feel like that's what you've done with both things with so far is are the, and don't um how do you say don't um release any top secrets now, but are there any other products that you're currently working on or any ideas that you have and don't don't let it out of the gate if it's <laughs> okay, you know how it is you, no. can, you gotta keep your your cards close to your chest, you know, so yeah i'm I'm actually glad you said that because I know the paintbrush you know paintbrushes have been the same for over a hundred years. every single paint <laughs> company has the same paintbrush, no innovation, right, so right. now. The new brush that I'm working on, that's why I looked to the side earlier because I have it right there. But the new brush that I'm working on now, everybody thinks my brush that I have now is like the most innovative brush. And it is. But the one that I'm working on now, the new one, it makes that one look like it's already old, you know. So yeah, yeah. I'm working on a, a new design. You know, I got a new design, new concept, you know, new samples that I'm working on, you know. So um, because that's the problem with the, like a lot of these companies. They're so big. They just get comfortable, whatever. But then you get somebody like me, you know, who's just really been chasing his dream forever. And I work day and night and, you know, I'm working on these ideas day and night, you know, until, you know, hopefully someday soon I'll get a break, you know. So anyways, yeah, I'm, I'm working 
on a new concept that nobody has right now. That's fantastic. Every- well, I think you will. It's just, um, you know, more exposure and just people and stuff. I, I, I would love to invite you to a business growth hub for the Southeast that um, I'm working on with Georgia Tech and Morehouse College and some other, you know, um, and Phrenology, my, my friend, um, Lakeisha French Merritt. And uh, it's creating like an ecosystem of um, Black and Hispanic entrepreneurs in the Southeast and eight states so we can lean in on each other and oh, help great, each other great. grow. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give you more information about that because I was reading actually just um, two weeks ago, an article came out about um, diversity, right? And about also um, the new consumer here in the U.S., but also worldwide. It's more of a global phenomena. And is that people want new, right? People want innovation. People now, now it's, it's kind of being flipped where it's like, crazy Eddie, sell yeah. <laughs> this thing that you think you need, right? Doesn't exist. Like the consumers know what they're, pain points and their needs are and they're like man if someone could just come up with xyz and then bam you deliver the goods then all of a sudden right you're cashing in and so Mm -hmm. i think that's happening more and more and that article um was talking about that about how consumers are actually defining um it like how big even big companies are creating new products and services that align with what they feel they need you know not the other way around yeah yeah totally agree that's that's really exciting stuff so listen i really applaud everything that you do i think that you're again amazing and uh i'm i'm excited for you i'm really excited for you i'm glad that your business is booming in the sense where you know you have something that's stable and that you were able to find right um uh, in entrepreneurship that financial freedom to explore your passions and and your bigger vision right of yourself and uh, i'm excited i'm excited to see you know um uh, where this goes and and to celebrate with you when when it actually happens because it's going to happen it's just tough of continuing to chip away, right? And finding the right, right opportunity and the right, you know, the right ear, honestly. You know, it's like when you least expect it, it's like, bam, all of a sudden it's, it's a thing, right? It it happens. And so I'm, I'm excited for you. Um, Any, any kind of takeaways you'd like to share from your experience for people that have a dream, right? That have this vision, that have ideas and feel like, I fuck it. You know, why even bother? You know, is there anything you'd like to share your experiences on, um, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly, you know, um, yeah. that, that you think might bring value to people that are are wanting to create, but feel maybe, you know, it's not a thing that they can even pursue? Yeah, you know, I, I feel a lot for those people, you know, and this is why, like, I'm glad we're talking and stuff, because, I mean, I, I can imagine, like, say, for example, like myself. I've been knocked down so many times and so many people have told me no. So I can't imagine somebody, you know, who, who I, and, and I know so many people go through that, you know, they have a great idea. Some people have the best idea, but after like maybe no for maybe two or three people, they just give up. They just mm-hmm. give up, you know, and that's when like, you know, I, I just say never give up. You know, I always say never give up and I know it's hard. I know, I know it's so hard and I know it's so easy to just give up. I I know it is, you know, and, um, um, but th- that's what I would say, you know, so just never give up. And this is why, like, I kind of go back to, like, um, you know, what I was telling you earlier about, you know, Latinos, you know, you know, like I said, I, w- I design for everybody. But for us, you know, like, we, like I said, we don't have that leader. You know, we don't have those leaders where we can, like, like I said, there's 60 million in the United States alone. That's not in counting Guatemala, Mexico, Honduras. There's a, <laughs> yeah. there's a whole bunch of us. There's a whole bunch of us. <laughs> But we don't have that leader. We don't have those leaders where we can say, you know, for anything, you know, for anything, you know, we don't have that, you know, and that's kind of like, that's my dream in life, you know, to kind of, for us to start, you know, you, me, you know, to to start now. So like, you never know where the future is going to take us, you know, and and I just see so much potential, like I said, especially for the Latin, you know, and not to get off track, but there's so many of us, like I said, and 
just to put it into perspective, you know, and I don't mean to get off track a little bit, but just check this out, right? On YouTube, Luis Fonsi, the song Despacito, mm -hmm. is the number one most watched video on YouTube. 7.5 mm -hmm. billion views. The number one over, over all the other YouTube videos from any category, that video is number one. 7.5 billion views. Daddy Yankee, you know, that, that song. Yeah, yeah. The, mm -hmm. You know, then we have other guys like Enrique Iglesias, an, another Latin, 3 billion views. He's got a couple of videos. Shakira, another 3 billion Ricky Martin, he's in the billions. So the the, the, the Latins, we're like in the billions. We, and, and we're like loyal, you know, like I look at those numbers compared to like, you know, other, you know, categories of music. And for example, like hip hop, they might get like in the hundreds of millions, you know, Kanye West, Drake, not only to get off, you know, but 50 million, 100 million on the views, but the Latinos are breaking billions, you know? And I see that like as an opportunity. And that's why like for me, I want to be here for everybody. Like, I hope people will see my videos and I want to help people if you have an idea, you know, and I'm the type of person, I'm not like these guys, Sharon Williams or Wilson, none of these guys that are taking idea or whatever. With me, I give you a handshake and that's pretty much it. You know, you can trust where I come from and I want yeah. people to feel that, you know, but I want to help people. Um, I just want to be there to help people because like I said, right now we don't have no leaders and there's so many of us. There's yeah. so many of us. Yes, you know, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I'm, I'm going to pick you up on that. I'm working with a good friend out in uh, San Jose Valley in Silicon Valley um, called um, Jesus Flores. He's the um, president of the Latino, uh, the, the Latino Business Foundation of Silicon Valley. And they have a lot of local entrepreneurs. I mean, if, if you think things are bad in Florida, in terms of the wealth gap, you know, with, you know, yeah. businesses owned by Latinos and Blacks, you know, um, it, it, compared to, you know, mainstream, you know, white-led organizations and businesses. Over there, it's like, whoa, like the gap is humongous, right? And this guy is um, really supporting Latino entrepreneurs specifically, I'm you know, he helps everybody, but, you know, he's really focused on, on, and so, you know, I, I'd love to introduce you to him because maybe you can mentor business owners that need so much help, you know, yeah. just knowing, be amazing. and just having like a, you know, a sounding board, you know, someone that they can say, Oye, ven acá, Mario. you know, yeah. it's like, I'm <laughs> hoping that. into this. Yeah, you know, I don't know what to do. And instead of them taking two years and a lot of trial and errors to figure it out, right? Yeah, yeah. One 10 minute phone call, bam. It's like, no, Bobby, that, don't do that. Do this, you know? Yeah, and that's you, what I'm talking you, about. Yeah, because yeah. that's exactly what I'm talking about. Because, you know, listen, man, if I can be the punch back, punching back for everybody else, trust me, you know, with businesses that failed and being ripped off and then, getting into patents and inventions and, you know, partners and all that stuff. I've been through all of that stuff. And, you know, and like I said, we can talk to next week of how much I've been through in life. You know? <laughs> yeah, so I know. That right there would be amazing, you know, to just do that because I can definitely, you know, cut shortcuts for people and just, just to be there, you know, Hey, yeah. you got a brother Mario over here is pretty much what I want to say, you know? Yes, totally. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for spending this time together and for sharing your story so candidly, right? And all of the lessons learned, right? Throughout that process, because I think it brings a lot of value um, to people, even like me as an entrepreneur, right? About not only um, learning new things, but also confirming that, yeah, it's painful sometimes, right? And it's okay to talk about it, right? But then when you when you land on the other side in a better place, the reward and the celebration is so much better. It's just so awesome, right? Because you feel yes. coño me lo gane. I <laughs> no, that, that that is so true. Yeah, it's so true. I, yeah, right. So you could really savor, right? The 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 success, you know, um, as small or as large as they might be, you know, um, because you know that you know what you went through to get there. So thank you. Thank you for um spending this time. Um, with me and and for sharing your story because I think it's it's gonna help a lot of people. Okay. Well, hey, thank you so much. Hey, I'm always here for you guys. If you ever need anything, you know, I'm here for you. Anything you need, you know. So I really appreciate you having me here, and you know, thank you, thank you so much. Sounds good. Take care. Okay, Mario.
All right. Take care. Thank you. Okay. Ciao. Un abrazo. Bye. Bye. This concludes this episode of I Have Something to Say. We want to thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to tell your friends about us. We're on Spotify and iTunes as well. There's more to come next week. And remember, if you have something to say, it's time to speak up.